Amen. Well, it's good seeing everybody here today. And um, this is our second week. Uh, we're talking about um, brokenness in our family relationships. Um, I know some people thought this was just going to be for married couples, and this is the furthest from the truth. So uh, I'm going to be talking about a subject this week that um, is ever rarely touched on. We're going to talk about the relationships between parents and their children, adult children with their parents with adult brothers and sisters. So this is, will be interesting here. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this being Valentine's week. It reminded me of this guy. He, he was on this beach and he was praying late at night. And so while he was praying, all of a sudden this voice came out of heaven and God said, you know, you're such a faithful child. He goes, you can ask me for anything you want and I'll grant that. So he said, okay, Father, you know, I, I've actually always wanted to go to Hawaii, but I'm scared to death to get on a plane. So I pray that you will um, make a bridge that goes from Florida all the way to Hawaii for me. And then the voice said, um, that's like the most ridiculous prayer I've ever heard. And you're going to have to maintain that bridge. And he goes, so why don't you ask for something a little easier? And he said, okay, Lord, um, well, it being Valentine's week and everything, I want to let you know, like, I've been married four times, and every one of my wives told me, like, I was the most insensitive, uncaring person who ever lived, and I didn't understand them. So I'm asking that you would give me this, like, unbelievable understanding that I would think the way a woman thinks, and that I would feel the way that a woman feels. And there was silence, and God then said, would you like two lanes or four lanes on that bridge? <laughs> I hope you have a good Valentine's Day this uh, week here and do something together. Um, you can always see how dysfunctional a family is when both parents have passed away. Uh, and we come to the reading of the will. Uh, where there's a will, there's a war. Uh, one family I knew well, uh, they did pretty well, and so they had a lot of children. And they left hundreds of thousands of dollars for each one of the children. Uh, today... They do not speak to each other because of what happened at the reading of that will. Uh, and you say, well, that's rich people's problems. Well, let me tell you about poor people, okay? Uh, one of, uh, let's see, one of your family members, let's say years ago, I'm in a funeral home, and I realized something was wrong, and somebody's guarding the coffin. So I said, hey, you know, what, what's going on here? And they said, well, you know, like he never had teeth, and his girlfriend never had teeth. And then she got like really jealous because he got teeth. And so when she'd leave the house, she would go and get his teeth and put them in her mouth. I didn't know you could do that, but they said she did. They said, and his mother is guarding him because we know that she is going to steal his teeth. And um, well, I thought about that. And I thought, well, the moral of the story for me is if you feel like you have nothing to leave your children, some of you could leave your teeth. You could. <laughs> We have a dentist here, Rod. He could maybe reform them, and you can keep the family smell together or something. I don't know. Um, dysfunction. There's dysfunction in all of our homes to some sort of degree. Um, that's why God gives you good Christian friends. Good Christian friends are an apology for your family members, the bad ones. Um, sometimes the dysfunction is so bad, you have to cut certain family members off, isn't it? It is true. It, it, like, it's very bad, or it could be dangerous. Um, I want to let you know, personally, I have found that there is good in goodbye sometimes. That's true also. If you know that's true, just say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, there we go. All right, so we're together on this. So uh, sometimes uh, blood is not thicker than water, and so what we're going to take a look at here is all of us are broken. All of our homes are broken. As long as we're dealing with this flesh, uh, it's going to be this way till Jesus returns. Okay, so what, but what we want to do, there's a lot of things we can do to heal broken relationships in our families and have good family relationships. Um, I just want to say one more thing. When you look at couples, uh, every couple that's here, one of you is a mute, and the other one is a maniac. One is a skunk, and the other one is a turtle. The skunk comes in, and they're all mad and upset, and they stink up the whole room. And the turtle retreats in their shell, and they don't communicate. 
Do, do you know people like this? And just so you know, after hundreds of weddings, um, I have learned that skunks always marry turtles. Just so you know that, because they actually get along. And the skunk and the turtle, then they have little baby skunks and turtles. And we just keep repeating this process. So as long as, again, we deal with our flesh, we receive problems down in the family tree there. Uh, the State of the Union address, did, did you watch that? It was long. It was good. But uh, this isn't a political move of what I'm saying here, just human nature. Okay, there was a political party that was there, uh, you can guess, and they just sat there. Now, I mean, they wouldn't stand for nothing. They wouldn't stand for the causes they were for. They, first time in history, they would not stand when the first lady stepped in. Okay, that, that's disgraceful. It really is. Why? Immaturity. Immaturity has nothing to do with your education, your position in life. Uh, your age has nothing to do with maturity, just so you know that. And the problems which we have in our relationships is definitely immature behavior. Okay, so here's the line of the day here. This is what we need to do. We, um, we are what we consistently do. We are what we consistently do. 1 Corinthians 14, 40. Let, let's all read this together, everybody. But all things should be done decently and in order. So what's that have to do with our relationships? Oh, it has everything to do with our relationships. If you want to have a good marriage, you want to have good kids, good family relationships, then you have to have good orderly habits. Okay, let me give you some. Uh, one, eat dinner together every single day that you can. Mom, if, if you can hold dinner off for dad into the later evening, it won't kill those kids, just so everybody could eat together. Stop eating in the living room with the television on. Stop that. That's bad. Uh, my wife and I made it a practice for 39 years. We just recently, for grandchildren reasons, uh, got a television in our living room so that we could play videos for them. And, um, but we would never, we never had a television in our living room. So the living room was a place to talk. The dining room was a place to talk. And so... Eat dinner together, no television on. Okay, next of all, if you have young children uh, or, any, or any children living at home, then have a family afternoon or a family evening every single week. I don't care what age they are, get it started right now. And that's holy ground. You, you shift it around saying, okay, nobody worked during those hours. You tell that high school job you can't work at this time. And that's holy ground. Okay, now this is how you make it successful. You have a base activity that you do if you don't know what to do. So in our home, it would be uh, maybe let's play games, order pizza. Let's have a special dessert. Pizza, dessert, and playing games together as a family, that doesn't cost much. And um, that's a good base to go back to. But then you make it more creative. All couples have a date night if you can every week. If you have young kids that doesn't work well, I'd go every other week. If, get the grandparents to watch the grandchildren. Grandparents should have a regular habit of talking, seeing the grandchildren. Ask them to do that. That's good for the grandparents. If you don't have that, find a couple. This is easy. Come to an agreement and say, we want to go on a date every other week, so we'll make you a deal. One week, we'll watch your children on Monday night, and the next week, you watch our children on Monday night. That, this works, and they'll appreciate that. Many people in your situation. The, uh, on it, my wife and I, now, again, it's later this year, but this is going to be 40 years of marriage. We still go on a date every single week. Okay, and we have the base date. The base date is this. I don't do a lot of shopping, so it's a bigger issue to me. We don't know what else we're going to do. Well, we're going to go to the base state, and that means we're going to go to the mall. We're going to eat at the food court. Okay, my wife has these goofy games you pay, play on your telephone where you get points if you run around the mall. You know what I'm talking about? You get, she makes money off this. I don't know. So we, um, but we go, we do that or go to the bookstore. Okay, that's the 
base, boring date. If we don't do anything else, we're going to do that. Or go out and get food, go get a movie and take it home. I mean, that's the lowest dates. Otherwise, we're going to get real creative and there's a lot of fun things you can do. You just learn that. Okay, I want, these are good orderly habits. Look what Jesus said, Luke 14, 28. He goes, if you want to build a tower, don't you sit down first and count the cost. If you want to have good family relationships, then you have to pay a price. That goes for husbands, wives, parents, children, and children of their older parents. What I want you to do, I want you to look at your life. What could you do to tweak your life by 1%? Constantly tweaking. I'm, I'm the great tweaker. I tweak every year things. I, I had like seven, eight things I wanted to do for this year, and I, I usually fulfill everything I, I go after. So I have a lot of little things. One of the little things I went after, I have people that want to argue with me all the time, and they catch me. It's real easy to get caught up into it. And you feel like if you shut your mouth, they win. And they want to argue with me about biblical things. So, you know, they'll come to me and say some horrendous, dumb, stupid thing. Okay, and that's fine. So I'm real gracious. But then I realize as we're talking, they really don't want to know the truth. They just want to argue. Do you know what I'm saying? No matter what facts you show them. So this year I decided I'm done. So you catch me at the door and you go, you know, you're wrong. I can't blah, 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 blah. I answer back to you. I go, huh, oh, oh, okay, yeah, sure. I kind of agree with you, just to get rid of you. That's why. Because no one is wasting my energy to argue with a person who has no sense. I'm just being, do you know what I'm talking about here? I don't have to be right. Do you know how freeing that is? I, I don't have to win the argument. I can just let it go, let it go. Okay, now you want to tweak things. Just by 1%. David Brailsford, he, he was uh, Great Britain's manager of the professional cycling team. So he came to them and he said, now listen, uh, we're going to do a lot of things in a small way. It's going to look stupid to you, but it, it, it's a big deal. So he said, first of all, he said, I want to put you on a diet, all of you, an athlete's diet. And I'm going to monitor each day how you're sticking with that diet. Okay, secondly, um, I've ordered new seats for all your bikes. It's the number one best seat for racing in America. He goes, uh, then for all of you, the air in your tires is going to be a little different according to your weight. And every day you're going to prove to me that the correct amount of pounds are in each tire. At nighttime when you go to bed, I want you to hand your pillows over to me. I have a new pillow. This has scientifically been proven to give the number one best sleep of pillows in the world. He goes, when we go to a hotel, he said, uh, I am paying for massage people to come in and they're going to give you massages to be sure you're well and relaxed for the race races during the next day and then he said i also put them through training of how to wash their hands properly how to avoid germs not to touch your eyes not to touch your noses that's why a lot of us get the flus and the colds okay so he said well he said, now my goal for a team that never went anywhere is in five years to win the Tour of France. Well, he was wrong. They won it in three years. In 2012, that manager led them to the Olympics, and they won 70% of the gold medals. Tweaking. Okay, what if you were always, don't, don't change things in a big way. Change them in little ways just by 1%. If you did that constantly and yearly, imagine how much better each year would become. Okay, communicate secondly as friends. In your family, communicate as friends. When your children are children, they have to be children. So how many of you have kids who are still living at home or in high school or younger? And, okay. okay, you are the parent, they are the child. I realize half of the entire church is divorced and we have a problem. And the problem is you hate to come down hard on the kids because they don't want to come to your house and you're arguing because mom's rules are easier than your rules. Listen, knock it off. If you have younger children, under 18, still in high school, you have to be a dad. You have to be a mom. You can't be their friends. If you have two teenagers and you say, you know what? I was like best friends with my teenagers and I never really had problems with them you are a really bad parent. Okay, I'll just tell you that right now. Because good parents have problems with their teenagers. Why? Because they're real parents. When they want to date, they don't let them date. When they want to 
run around, do things. They don't let them run around, do certain things because they love them and their mom and dad. Now, when you become, or your child becomes an adult and they turn 18, instantly, overnight, the switch is turned over and you have a conversation with the kids. Say, I will now respect you as an adult. Now, you're still living in the house and there's certain rules. You have to follow that. But I'm not going to tell you what to do anymore. From that time forward, for the rest of your life, parents, don't you ever say, I am your dad, I am your mom, you are supposed to respect me. They don't respect you by now, just skip it, okay? That's on them, they're wrong, forget it. You are to be friends with your children now. Your children are to be your friends. Your siblings, adult siblings, you should be treating them like both of you are still 15 years old. So here you are, you're 22 years old, you're 25 years older, and your siblings say something, and you go flying off the... You have no right doing that. That is so juvenile. It's so immature. Just, just ignore it if you don't want to listen to it. You have no right as a sibling to tell the other sibling what to do or how to live their life. We have no right to tell our children, our parents, that's stupid. Why would you do that? Or Treat them like they are your very best friend. And you know what we do with our good friends? If you are a good friend, some of you don't know what that means. So <laughs> what you do is you gently try to guide them. You try to entice them to do the right thing. Encourage, 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 encourage is what we're supposed to do. Children, be friends with your parents. Realize mom and dad, they're having a hard time. They have stresses. They have anxieties. They have fears. Next of all, keep a sense of humor. Let's start doing some more laughing in the house, joking around, horsing around. I'm not talking. I mean, you can tease each other as long as it's not getting the major insults. Let's learn how to handle loss. And video, I'm leaving for a second. Okay, here we go. This right here. Do you remember this game? Shoots and ladders. One of the best games. Do you know why this is such a good game? If you're 30 years old, or if you're three years old, you can't beat the three-year-old. And the reason why, at the toss of the dice, you either go up the ladder, which is great, or you go down the chute. That's life, isn't it? We're constantly going up and we're going down, and we're going up and we're going down. One of the major things missing in families today is families are not working together to handle loss. We want to be able to laugh some of our losses. Um, we want to laugh, uh, laugh it off. We want to forget about it. Other ones, we want to cry together. We encourage each other. We empower each other. Now, the way I know this is a real problem, more than ever today, people are quitting everything. They're quitting their marriages. They're quitting school. They're quitting their jobs. They're quitting. They're just quitting. They're quitting. They're quitting. They're quitting. We need to have a service. I want to have a service on, I'm going to quit quitting. Quit quitting. Okay, but we can't do that unless we have some power around us and we get this together in the family. Next of all, put love into action. I, I hear these couples all the time on the phone. I, I love you. I love you. I lo they call each other 15 times. They say, I love you. No, I love you. No, I love you. No, I love you better. I, I like what Pastor Sam said. Well, if you love them, why don't you get off the couch and do something for them? Okay? Why don't we stop talking about it? That's what God says. And notice here, he says in 1 John 3, 18, little children, notice what he calls us, little children. He's not talking to kids, he's talking to us. Let us not love in word or talk, but in deeds and in truth. Let's put some action behind that. Well, how do you love? You don't have to do big things. Do you know the best way to show love is to think small. Think small. All the time, keep your family members on your mind thinking about them, sending them a text. It's their birthday. Celebrate it. Send a text to them. Hey, happy birthday. Make some fun of them. They're in a text. Hey, you still look good. Even if they don't, you know, just tell them. That. Okay, when you get together, say, hey, I, I want to give you a little something. Nothing big, all little things. You're helping with the dishes. You're helping with this. Brothers and sisters, adult brothers and sisters should be helping each other. Like, hey, I can ride you to the airport and drop you off. Or, hey, yeah, I can go to your house and let the dog out. I know you guys are going to be busy. And 
Yeah, it takes time, doesn't it? Okay, we're talking about little acts of kindness, appreciation. I'm thinking of you, and I, I care about you. Siblings, let's celebrate the success of each other. Now, I want to give parents just a little guidance on this. The way you do it is this. When your kids are younger and they have a success, then what you do is you let all the kids know, hey, you know, Joey here did this thing, and this is just great. We talk about it. We clap for him, and we have a celebration dinner. Now, my family's real big into this. So but I'm like the king on it, and I'm like so what I'll do is I'll find out that this child over here has done a certain thing. They got this job. They, they, they had straight A's. So it was kind of crazy. And uh, so, so what I would do is I would let all the other kids know, hey, guess what so-and-so did? You know, sometimes I'll call one kid up and say, hey, why don't you send them a text and let them know? And so they get into that, start to, hey, that's great. We're happy for you. And we're always celebrating something. Brothers and sisters, celebrate each other's success. Never be jealous. Okay, this is in every family. Competition. Okay, knock it off. Somebody mature. Now, if you can't do it, it's because you're immature. <laughs> okay, if you're mature and you're spiritual, though I want you to do is I want you to say, okay, that's it, I'm not going to be jealous. Okay, so they say, hey, I want you to come over and see my new car. And you look at the car and you go, hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, they say, oh, yeah, we bought a house. We take. So you're giving a tour of the house, and the sister-in-law is walking around going, hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what that message is, right? Okay, first of all, okay, let's say I'm the sister or brother-in-law that's doing it. First of all, um, I look like really stupid right now. I, I'm in first grade. I'm in first grade. I am. I'm like some little kid, and, and I'm like, I, it's so obvious that you are so jealous of them, and this is so unbelievably embarrassing embarrassing for you? I mean this. This is really embarrassing. Okay, you know how you overcome jealous feelings? Listen, this puts you on top. What you do, I learned years ago, what I would do is I would go to them and go, wow, I can't believe it. I mean, I would tell them once. I'd tell them four times. I can't believe it. That's awesome. That's unbelievable. I would brag about, I, here, I, would, I have a brother who's worth, I mean, millions and millions and millions of dollars. He is. I brag on him. And I tell him I brag on him. And you know what that does to him? It makes him real humble. Why does that make him humble? Because he looks at me, that your loved one will look at you and go, that sister-in-law, brother-in-law, brother-sister, they'll look at you and go, wow, that's really nice. Like, I know that they're not doing this well, but they're really happy for us. That puts you in a special place in their heart. And you know what happens to you? All of a sudden... All those jealous feelings begin to dissipate. You actually are happy for them. Hey, let's be upfront. There are some, I, I have a couple kids that are in careers that are crazy. I, the one boy is going to be a doctor. Okay, I'm going to be upfront. I don't care how much. His wife's going to be a doctor. Pray they come to Pittsburgh because when they get those jobs, I want them tithing at my church, okay? It'll pay, it'll pay me and the pastor's incomes. And um, now I hope they do really well. But let me tell you something. I wouldn't want to do that. You know what I'm saying? I don't care what you get. <laughs> I don't want to go through 12 years of schooling. I, I don't want to do it. That's okay. That's good for you. Let's, let's brag on each other, and let's truly celebrate each other's success. Look at Ephesians 4.31. It said, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Listen, li don't leave any sibling out. Mom and dad, I don't care who your son marries. I don't care who your daughter marries. It's too bad. They are now your child. I said a long time ago, if I saw something bad happening in my family, one of my children, I learned from my congregation. I would bring my enemy in real close to me because I don't want them taking my child away. Do you know what I'm talking about? So then that in-law is now your child. They're the best. They're the greatest. You brag on the in-law. You don't ever go after your in-law about your daughter, your son, unless that guy's like beating your daughter. You, you, don't, you just don't do that, okay? Don't, don't. Sister and brother-in-laws, you go, I don't like it. I don't speak to them. I won't look at them. Okay, so you come to this function, and everybody can tell that you got a little riff with them. You're just ignoring them. You're going to fight, and you just won't speak to them. You won't look at them. Do you know how juvenile you look? Do you know how embarrassing 
this is. I mean, we're talking humiliating. Again, are you 10? You know how stupid you look with your own children? And then you know what you do? You teach it to the children. And then they go into their next family, and they got all these problems. And, and what they do, they ignore people. They don't talk to people, and they're fighting with people. And I, I had somebody in the early service, one, one of the worst family fights, fighting families I've ever seen in my life I was talking to over the years. Mom talked to the kids. Okay, somebody's got to break this cycle and start acting like a Christian. And say, hey, that's my sister's husband and, or my brother's wife, and I'm just, I'm just going to love them. I don't have to hang out with them personally. I don't have to go play with them in the backyard. But I can, you know, just be nice and kind. Unconditional love. When your family gets together, extended family, adult family, with your children, okay, first of all, uh, show up, okay? <laughs> show up, that's the big one. Okay, let's say your family doesn't show up. You never yell at them. Oh, yeah, we were really disappointed. We are, we're expecting you to be there. Don't do that. You encourage your friends. Talk to them. You know, if you could, that'd be great. They don't make it. Say, hey, that, that's okay. If you continue, say, wow, yeah, I really miss you. I mean, if you could, that'd be great. Don't whine. Don't demand. You can't do that. You can't tell your kids what to do as adults. But also be with them. You're with family. Be with them. Stop looking at your smartphone. Stop looking at your text messages. Facebook, one 13-year-old girl was in my office a couple years ago. She goes, I was telling my mom something like really important. I told her it was important. And she goes, while she was looking and listening, she kept looking at her phone. She kept looking at her phone. She goes, I knew she could care less. And I don't talk to my mom anymore. Don't carry the phones to the table. Don't play games when you're with people. And stop reading the news. Now, let's say you're hanging out all day together. That's a different story. But when you're with them, look at them. There's power in our eyes as we look at people and we look at them in the eyes and it shows compassion. It shows that we care about them. I, I know sometimes I'll be talking to somebody that's hurting. I'm mean, hurting like really, really, really bad. And while I'm looking at them, if I look at them long enough in the eyes, I can feel their pain and I'll have to kind of look away for a moment. That's the power of eye contact. You look at people that you love the most. Work together as a team. One anthropologist went to Africa and he was studying this tribe and, and, and he had this basket of fruit and he had it all decorated up, put it under a tree, got the children of the tribe together. He drew a line, said, when I say go, all of you run and the first one there gets the basket. So he told them to go. They paused, these young children, they looked at each other. They took each other's hands. And this African tribe of children ran together as a group. They gathered around the basket of fruit, and they shared the fruit. So the anthropologist went to the oldest child and said to the girl, why, why did you do that? She looked surprised. She goes, how can any one of us be happy if any one of us are sad? Family, I am because we are. Colossians 3.13, it says it right there in the middle of our verse, look here. If you have a complaint against somebody else, he goes, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must forgive. Are you a child of God? Are you a believer? Have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you been forgiven of your sins? Okay, I'm giving you no grace. You have no choice. You must forgive. Now, this could be another sermon, but the Bible is very clear that if you can't forgive, it's because you are not a Christian. That's why you act the way that you do. Are you a Christian? Are you forgiven? Or are you not? If you've never had that moment in your life in which you realize that you're lost and you're a sinner and you understand what the cross is all about and that Jesus died on that cross and he paid for all of your sins as God, but he beat that and overcame that and arose from the grave, you can become a Christian today. But if you're a Christian, you have to forgive. Maybe you'd understand this a little better from a child's book. Children's story of two brothers. They became farmers and they lived side by side. And one day they got along and they were adults. 
and everything's great, and then they had an argument. It went for a day, and it went for a week, it went for a year. Finally, there, there was this knock at the door, and the older brother opened up the door, and there was this older carpenter with a long beard, and he had a toolbox. He said, I was wondering, do you have any work I can do around the farm? The older brother said, oh, yeah, I got a job for you. He said, you see that house over there? See that crick? There used to be lush green grass between the two of us, but we had an argument. He rerouted that crick to divide our property as a border, and he did it out of spite. I want you to build a 10-foot tall fence between his yard and my yard so I never have to see his face ever again. The old wise carpenter said, oh, okay. Well, the man went away for the day and did errands all day long in the city. And before nightfall, he made it home and he pulled in the driveway. And he looked and his eyes were bulging. He got out of the car. He ran over. Couldn't believe it. Instead of the carpenter building a 10-foot fence, he built an arched, beautiful bridge over the creek with the most artistic banisters on each side. He was in shock, and as he was staring at this, just then his brother came to the other side of the bridge. His brother came running across the bridge, and he embraced him, and he said, I can't believe that you did this. After everything I said and everything I did, and I want to let you know I'm really, really sorry. And the old brother embraced him. He goes, I'm, I'm sorry too. Well, then he saw the old carpenter leaving, and he said, hey, would you be willing to do some more work for us? And he said, no. I have other bridges I need to build. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I, Lord, I know that there's some bridges that need to be built. I know that there's some peace that needs to be made. With every head bowed and every eye closed, is there a believer here or at the cafe that would say, Pastor Mike, there's something I need to do. You, you know what it is. Raise your hand. I'm holding you to this. Raise your hand. Say, yes, I, there's, thank you. Thank you. Anybody, thank you. Thank you. Put your hands up because I want you to do something with this. Thank you. Here in the cafe, they put your hands down. Is there somebody here, first of all, that would say, Pastor, I, I don't even know if I'm a Christian and I want to become a Christian. If you want your sins forgiven right now, right now, I want you just to pray with me. Pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, my Lord and my God, I believe with all my heart you died on that cross and paid for all of my sins with your blood. I believe you arose from the grave. I ask for forgiveness of my sins right now. I ask you to come into me to save me, to live within me. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you just prayed that and you meant that, it's that simple. I want you to write that on your connection card. I accepted Christ so we can talk to you about that. And, and now, Father, right now, I pray for all believers. Oh, Lord, you know what the problem is? I pray that we'd make peace. I pray that we would do the right thing. I pray that we would respond the right way. I pray that we would find healing. I pray that we would act maturely. I pray that we would forget about ourselves. And now, Lord, I thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.